If everyone could take their seats, we can get started. For those of you who are new to our campus, welcome to William James College. My name is Robert Dingman. I'm on the faculty here, and I'm very pleased and feel quite honored today to be able to introduce our speaker. But before I do so, I would like to thank some of our new friends at Community Services Institute who have co-sponsored and helped to um, organize this event, in particular uh, Mary Ledoux, who I just met. Thank you very much for your work. I'd also like to thank the, the Seiko family. They've uh, really put themselves out to um, help make this possible through a per personal connection with, uh, with Dr. Krippner. I'd also like to thanks our, thank our friends at the Department of Veterans Services um, here in Massachusetts. Um, it is through their funding of our programs that we, are, we were able to um, actually help put, put this event together today. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Dr. Sonia Suri, um, who um, helped to um, pull the last details of this evening together. Um, we're going to have a, a, um, a presentation by Dr. Krippner, after which we'll have time for questions and answers. Um, he's made it known to me that um, <clears throat> we need to speak clearly and loudly so that he can hear our questions. Uh, when it comes to that point in time, I'll travel around with the microphone so that, so that we can all hear the questions. Um, but now let me introduce Dr. Stanley Krippner. <clears throat> he is a professor of psychology at Saybrook University and a pioneer in the study of consciousness. He has conducted research in the areas of dreams, hypnosis, shamanism, and dissociation, often from a cross-cultural perspective with an emphasis on anomalous phenomena that seem to question mainstream paradigms. Dr. Krippner has written extensively on altered states of consciousness, dream, patho te telepathy, hypnosis, shamanism. Among his many books, he is co-author of Extraordinary Dreams, and in particular for our purposes tonight, Haunted by Combat, Understanding PTSD and War Veterans. He is also co-editor of The Psychological Impact of War on Civilians and varieties of anomalous experience, examining the scientific evidence, as well as many other books and articles. Dr. Krippner was an early leader in Division 32 of the American Psychological Association, the division connected with humanistic psychology, and served as its president from 1980 to 1981. He also served as president of Division 30, the Society for Psychological Hypnosis, and is a fellow of five APA divisions. He's conducted workshops and seminars around the world. Uh, he actually made me cross out a long list of about 50 countries. <laughs> he has also given uh, invited addresses for the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Russian Academy of Ped Pedagogical Sciences, and the School for Diplomatic Studies in Montevideo, uh, Uruguay. He is a fellow of the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion and has published cross-cultural studies on spiritual content in dreams. Please welcome Dr. Stanley Krippner. Uh, thank you. Thank you, William, for a very gracious introduction. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am always delighted to speak about PTSD, even though it's not a delightful topic but it's a topic that is very close to me, very close to me personally, because when I was very young, I was a, um, clo very close to my cousin, Marcia Gates, who was a nurse in the Second World War, and she was captured in the Philippines when the Japanese invaded that country. She spent the entire war in a prison camp doing the best she could to nurse the people that uh, were imprisoned with her. And when she came back from the war, everybody, of course, in the family was delighted, but I could sense that she was never quite the same. Uh, she used to be very exuberant and, and flamboyant and cheerful, and now she was very glum, very reserved, almost depressed. And, of course, at this time I realized that she had PTSD. And then, much later, a close friend of mine when I was living in New York City retired from a very important position when he reached 60 and immediately committed suicide. 
and I found out from his wife that he had PTSD, again from the Second World War, and he had been a workaholic. He had masked everything, but once he was retired, all of the symptoms, especially the nightmares, came back to him, haunted him, and the pain was just so intense that he killed himself. And, of course, I have several other friends from various wars, various traumas who have PTSD, but those are the two that stand out in my memory, and that sort of impelled me to do some work in this field, even though I am not a psychotherapist, I do not see clients, but I do have three books that I've edited or co-authored on this particular topic, and am happy to talk about it uh, whenever I can. And William very graciously said there will be questions and answers. Yes, there will be questions. I cannot guarantee that there will be answers. <laughs> there is really a great deal about this field that we don't understand, even though uh, it's been around for a while. And you can trace examples of PhD back in the Bible, back to Homer, back to Shakespeare, and under different names, the effects of war, the effects of combat, the effects of rape, the effects of earthquakes, the effects of violence, of spouse abuse, of child abuse, all of these are brought on uh, symptoms of what today we call PTSD. So, Soren Kierkegaard, the famous philosopher, believed that life can be best understood as nonlinear, limited intentionality and purpose. And this is a very, very important axiom to remember when you deal with PTSD because it's not linear. You can't do cause and effect very effectively. You deal with something that complex PTSD and it's very difficult to know what is cause and what is effect, which makes it such a complicated condition to treat. And there is one major constant, and that is change. That's against Kierkegaard. Many events cannot be controlled, yet they shape the character of the people that they impact. The Greek philosopher Epictetus wrote that it's not life events that shape people, it is the way that they experience those events. This applies to PTSD. The people who are, I don't use the word PTSD victims, I say PTSD survivors because uh, that's a more positive way to look at them. Yes, it, they've gone through hell and back, but at least they've survived. And the Epictetus quote has been echoed by many philosophers throughout history, and it is the core of rational emotive behavior therapy, who some of you know about. And the founder of rational emotive behavior therapy was Albert Ellis. We're honored to have his wife with us tonight, Debbie Ellis and she will have a little cameo presentation for you later in my talk. So, an incident outside the range of, ex of ordinary experience within a given challenge may be hard to integrate. If it affects an individual's ability to function, the experience is called traumatic, and there are historical and current examples, rape, domestic violence, incarceration, torture, war, motor vehicle accidents and natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, and fires. So it's not only the people who are cruel to other people, it's nature that's often cruel to people and that cause these traumas and many of which bring on PTSD. Now obviously not everybody who has a trauma gets PTSD. There are some people who are very resilient for one reason or another. And what brings about PSD in one person can leave another person virtually unscathed because of these individual differences. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the fifth edition, has a number of criteria. The term survivor, as I said before, is commonly used to describe someone with PTSD whether they have recovered or not. It's a more positive term than PTSD sufferer or PTSD victim. Criterion A from DSM-5, an individual has been exposed to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence, and is left with an indelible memory of that event. And some combat veterans are traumatized by these events. 
paradoxically, witnessing an enemy's death during combat can evoke satisfaction despite possible trauma, while death of a comrade exposes soldiers to their own vulnerability and the breaking of bonds with their unit. And of course, this is often explained by terror management theory, TMT, which is an example of existential thinking and which my students at Saybrook study extensively because I think it's so important. And terror management theory is something that I think that all people who work with PTSD and trauma in general should know about because it serves oftentimes as the core of the psychotherapeutic pro uh, program. More DSM-5 criteria, intrusion symptoms. Many PTSD survivors experience flashbacks when they're awake and nightmares when they are asleep. And as we'll find out later, many of these nightmares are very, very repetitive. They repeat the same damn trauma over and over and over again, and the person's like stuck. They can't get out of that trauma. They cannot stop the nightmare. Yes, there are therapies for that, which we will be talking about. And then there is avoidance of either internal stimuli, like memories, thoughts, feelings about the trauma, or external reminders, people's places, conversations, activities, etc., of the trauma. Some people will not go to certain types of movies because they're afraid they'll be reminded of the trauma. Some people will not honor different anniversaries or birthdays because they'll be aware of the trauma. So avoidance is very, very common. Some people will not celebrate the 4th of July because the firecrackers remind them of the explosions and the IEDs that went off. Cognitive and mood changes, including dissociation, shame, guilt, detachment, and the inability to feel joy. Dissociation is much more common in PTSD than the previous DSMs indicated. Now there's a whole subcategory of dissociative PTSD, where people dissociate from the here and the now and to avoid the pain go off someplace else. And Shame, of course, is different than guilt. Shame is mainly concerned with what other people think of, of you. And they might be shameful for the things that they have experienced or the things done for them or the things that they think that they have done. Guilt being more and more internal. Many of you have heard of survivor's guilt. A whole company might have been wiped out. And the uh, person is feeling guilty. Why? Did I survive? I feel guilty because I have survived. This also ties in with the PTSD accompanying survivors of the Holocaust during the Second World War. Why did I survive? You know, millions of my uh, comrades, my compatriots died. What was ha what's wrong with me that I survived? Instead of looking at it positively, they look upon it negatively because of survivor guilt. Hyperarousal. The brain communicates to the body that it must be on guard at all times against the trauma that initiated the PTSD. At home, war veterans with PTSD know that the original threat no longer exists, yet their body responds as if they are still in combat. So here you have a mind-body split. The mind knows better, but the body is still stuck. And this feeling of stuckness is one of the characteristics of PTSD. Now, I'm interested in PTSD nightmares because I have an extensive background in dreams and in sleep. And PTSD nightmares are a different type of nightmare than the ordinary nightmare, which, by the way, can serve very adaptive functions. Non-traumatic nightmares are regulated through extinction the systematic removal of emotional memories from the brain and the body. Dreams, in my opinion, are very adaptive in terms of human evolution and human survival. People have uh, dreams that are unpleasant. This is a way of processing the negativity through their system at night so that they'll be bright and refreshed during the day. Um, it's not that easy with the PTSD nightmares 
they are so traumatic, they are so intense, that the body brain cannot process them adequately, and so they keep repeating themselves. It's like knocking at the door, knocking at the door, and nobody's able to open the door, so they stay stuck. In contrast, traumatic night experiences can become ingrained in the brain and body, causing repetitive nightmares. These traumatic nightmares are highly resistant to being eradicated from the brain and the body. And these two types are persist, processed differently by the brain. So to get rid of the PTSD nightmares, or at least to reduce their severity, you literally have to rewire the brain. And when we talk about therapy, we'll get into ways that do that a new resolution to the nightmare or a new nightmare completely has to be focused upon, rehearsed until it finds the way into the brain-body system and a new nightmare, a modified nightmare, takes its place. I tell my students, just remember three Bs. When you work with PTSD, three things have to change. The brain, the body, the behavior. and all three of those are very, very crucial in approaching any type of therapy for PTSD, in my opinion. That's why therapies for PTSD have to be very holistic. They have to take into contact what's happening in the brain, what's happening in the body, and how is it affecting behavior. So many PTSD survivors sleep during the day rather than at night, but they're often affected by nightmares no matter what time they sleep. So it doesn't do any good. They try sleeping during the day, they have nightmares during the day. Dream workers do not need to conduct an extensive interpretation of the replaying PTSD nightmares images and narratives. It is better to modify the nightmare and resolve the issue it presents. In other words, you don't have to do a interpretation of the PTSD nightmare because it's either a direct replay of the trauma or it is a modified, very, very modified replay of the trauma. And one of the first steps is to try to get the trauma to be symbolized in the dream or have the dream be a metaphor of the trauma. Dreams are just marvelous things because they are so efficient. They take sometimes weeks or even years of experience and sum them up into one little metaphor that can uh, be related as a dream using symbol. A symbol is an image that represents something much deeper. A metaphor is an activity that represents something much deeper. PTSD nightmares are notoriously absent of symbols and metaphors. They are usually replays of the whole thing. Once they reach the symbol and metaphor level, then they're much more easily resolved and sort of flushed through the system. Significant processes for the control and occurrence of trauma-related nightmares can be found in the brain's limbic system, which is constantly working to manage the continuous nature of fear <coughs> memories and other processes initiated in the course of dreaming. Nightmares are continually activated in the amygdala when coupled with associated traumatic memory stored in the hippocampus. The amygdala and hippocampus in, which are part of the midbrain, are both very, very essential components of the system that is involved in PTSD nightmares. In conjunction with the amygdala, the hippocampus regulates several aspects of fear memory expression, including fear extinction, contextual fear, and conditioned fear. One of the problems is the midbrain is so active, it's not making a connection with the cortex which brings some reason, some rationality, some symbolism, some metaphor into it. And once you can make that connection with cortical activity, this is helpful in terms of reducing the nightmares. In ordinary dreaming, fear memories may become stimulated, but they are quickly alleviated through extinction, a process that both minimizes their impact on functioning and also strengthens the limbic system's ability to inhibit future fear memories from developing. That's an ordinary dreaming. But the nightmares of people with PTSD 
are accompanied by intense amygdala activation associated with recurring memories of the traumatic experiences. The brain of a trauma survivor continuously tries to resolve or dampen this activation, but is unable to do so because the fear of memory keeps being triggered over and over again. So here you have sort of a capsule summary of what's going on in the PTSD uh, nightmare. And this is the challenge. This is a challenge for therapists because no matter how many uh, pharmaceutical drugs you take, no matter how much talk you do to the therapist, until you get down to the brain level and restore healthy brain functioning, those uh, PTSD nightmares are going to persist. And this is why the uh, pharmaceutical medication that's used, in my opinion, should only do short term because it simply masks what's going on. It does not really correct the brain in a healthy way. Now, nightmares that occur after trauma rarely lead to extinction of the incident, which is why medication may be beneficial. Processing of alpha blocker is commonly used with some palliative success. And as you know, palliative is very superficial. However, medication cannot alleviate the existential issues associated with the trauma. We've mentioned them, shame, survivor guilt, damaged worldview. For example, many PTSD survivors no longer see the world as fair or just or believe that everything works out for the best. Those, of course, are what we would call irrational belief systems. And those irrational belief systems lead to what native indigenous people call soul loss. Yes, they have PTSD too, and they think the soul has been lost. And the shamans go out to try to retrieve the soul. They have ceremonies, rituals, sweat baths, sand paintings, many, many ways to retrieve the soul. And I should say that their record of accomplishment is very good because they have community support. They have other members of the community come in, especially community members who have been through traumas themselves. And in PTSD therapy, it works best if there are other veterans, other soldiers, other trauma survivors who have gone through similar things and can share experiences and share how they have been meeting those challenges. Therefore, medication will not provide recovery from the overall life-altering effects of trauma, but may allow for some stabilization of symptoms. And that's, of course, better than nothing. Psychotherapeutic treatment of PTSD also has a significant impact of recovery. In conjunction with medication, psychotherapy may increase the client's likelihood of recovery. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy has shown great promise in alleviating PTSD symptoms, although the studies have involved too small a number of participants for conclusive judgments to be made. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get a sip of water that I'm going to expand a little bit about psychedelic psychotherapy because I was just at the psychedelic science conference a week ago in Oakland, California. And I sat in on half a dozen studies which all showed salubrious results of using MDMA, uh, ketamine, ayahuasca, and psilocybin with PTSD survivors. And the results were better than any psychotherapy that I've seen. Now, you might ask, well, if it's so good, why is it more being done? Why are just a few dozen people given a chance? Political, political reasons. Um, Big Pharma is against it. They don't want something that will be a quicker treatment than what uh, the psychotropic drugs can offer. But there are other more subtle influences. Last week's New Yorker magazine had an excellent article on psychedelic therapy. And they questioned two people who are critics of psychedelic therapy. And the interesting thing is that those two people did not deny that psychedelic therapy worked. They gave implicit acknowledgement, yes, yes, MDMA works, but the first person said, but it has side effects aside from uh, relieving PTSD. What side effects? Well, it, 
it, it, it keeps people high. It gives them an altered state of consciousness. Well, so what? An altered state of consciousness, being high, that's better than being in pain with depression and killing oneself. And as you know, 22 veterans kill themselves every day, most of them having PTSD. So you hear this, and I've been hearing this for decades, folks, whenever you talk about psychedelic psychotherapy, well, yes, it works, but it gets people high. Our culture has a bias against non-ordinary consciousness. It's what we call a monophasic culture. Indigenous cultures are polyphasic cultures. They shift between altered states of consciousness very easily. Now this bias against altered states of consciousness touches psychotherapy. We have ample evidence that hypnotically facilitated psychotherapy, whether the main psychotherapy is cognitive behavioral or humanistic, transpersonal, existential, psychodynamic, whatever, when you put hypnosis in it, the psychotherapy is, long, is shorter, produces greater client satisfaction, and produces more insights. Tons of research and in the literature, but only a fraction of people use hypnotically facilitated psychotherapy because people are reluctant to lose control of their mind, which is what they think hypnosis does. Same thing happens with putting dreams into psychotherapy. The research of Clara Hill, ample literature that you introduce dream work into psychotherapy, again, greater client satisfaction, shorter time in psychotherapy, more insights, virtually the same results with hypnotically facilitated psychotherapy. And again, it doesn't matter. You can add, um, you can add dream work to cognitive behavioral to existential to psychodynamic uh, gestalt any type of psychotherapy and it works. It's rarely used because you're dealing with altered states of consciousness and our culture is biased against altered states of consciousness. Now if hypnosis and dream work is avoided you can imagine the problems that come up when you talk about putting MDMA ecstasy into psychotherapy. The problems multiply tenfold because this brings us to the second objection to psychedelic psychotherapy that a government spokeswoman in the, uh, in the government said, oh yes, it works, but we have made such progress in getting young people to avoid psychedelics. If they thought that psychedelic could be used psychotherapy, they'd get the wrong message. They'd think it's okay for them to take it. Folks, I've been, heard, I've been hearing that, getting the wrong message for decades, for decades. No, marijuana can't be legalized uh, for medication. Young people will get the wrong message that it's okay to smoke marijuana. The states that have used medical marijuana have shown no increase in young people using marijuana. The two states that have legalized marijuana, no increase in young people uh, t using marijuana. You know, these government experts that keep talking about getting the wrong message literally don't know what they're talking about. They're bureaucrats that are trying to uphold a status quo which is unworkable and which has monetary benefits for the corporate world, not only big farm, but big psychiatry, which is going to suffer if some better way and some more, some more radical way of psychotherapy has come about. Now, again, this is my own personal point of view, but I think it's necessary to introduce that because of the increasing uh, number of studies that are coming out showing, yes, psychedelics are working and the results are no longer in obscure journals, they're in major medical journals, and I want you folks to be up to date because you're going to see more about this as the years go by. Okay, having said that, approaches targeting PTSD symptoms, well, any number of things. Implosion therapy, psychodynamic therapy, humanistic existential therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, expressive arts therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy like rational emotive behavior therapy, all of them work. Whenever you see studies, yes, all of these have worked. All of them are evidence-based. Here is the problem, though, folks. 
When you take a look at the veterans with PTSD, one half never go to psychotherapy at all, VA or anything. The half that do go, half drop out after one session. So something is wrong with the uh, psychotherapy or the therapist. Of the 25% who do stick with it, yes, they achieve benefit if they stick with it long enough, but half of them drop out before the program is over. So when we talk about 22 veterans killing themselves every day, take a close look at those statistics. 18 of those 22 have never been to therapy at all, never been to the VA at all. Now that's very encouraging because it means that the four who have been to psychotherapy, whether it's good therapy or not, whether they've dropped out or not, uh, at least they've gotten some benefit from it. And so there is, I keep reiterating this, there's plenty of evidence that psychotherapy works. Some works better than others, but at least it works. It's just getting people to go to the psychotherapy and the psychotherapy to be most effective, in my opinion, has to involve peer support, social support, community support, family support, talking with other veterans, which means you can do group therapy effectively. And, and again, too much of the therapy doesn't do this. And on top of everything else, all the other statistics I've given you, most of these therapists at the VA or any place else dealing with veterans with PTSD have never taken a course on how to treat PTSD. It's not in the curriculum. They really don't know what they are doing. And if they succeed, it's probably because of other reasons, because it's probably because of expectation, placebo effect. The veteran is at least getting somebody to talk to, at least thinking this is something that might work. So the sad state of affairs in terms of psychotherapy for uh, PTSD is certainly leading to the suicides and the unfortunate uh, social situations we have today. Okay, for recurring PTSD nightmares, the dreamer is kept from resolving basic existential conflicts and moving ahead. The therapeutic challenge is to thaw their mind from that frozen place in time and space. The words frozen, the words stuck, are very, very good words to explain what is happening with the PTSD nightmares. Failing to target the nightmare as a comorbid or independent complaint impairs treatment. Kramer and Kinney, uh, di oh, that's a reference, pardon me. It diverts patients away from evidence-based therapies for nightmares. All of these references are in the last slide, and my PowerPoint is available, of course, from anybody that wants to copy it. In regard to recovering from recurrent nightmares, psychotherapy may focus on listening to PTSD survivors tell their nightmare story or having them create an alternative ending to the nightmare and replay it in their mind immediately after awakening from the nightmare or even within it. And now we're getting into treatment for psychotherapy. And this is where imagery rehearsal therapy comes into the picture. This is the single most effective way of dealing with PTSD nightmares, and there are many, many varieties of imagery rehearsal therapy. Once they saw that nightmares are not a secondary phenomenon that will fade away with time and treatment, Krakow and his associates developed, developed imagery rehearsal therapy, IRT, that attacks the nightmare directly. IRT involves some degree of exposure to nightmare content as well as rewriting or rescripting components of the nightmare. Now, Krakow and his group have a radical point of view that I sympathize with. If you can change the nightmare is the first goal of treatment. If you can focus on the nightmare before anything else, all the other symptoms will fall in line. They see the nightmare as the focal symptom of PTSD, and I think they can make a good case for that. The practitioner asks dreamers to write down the nightmare, but to change it or make it less traumatic. The dreamers spend time each day comparing the revised dream to the original dream. So there's homework assignments, they do this every day. Individuals mentally rehearse the new dream during the day. 
and eventually the nightmare itself begins to shift. Why? Because experiences we have during the day are reflected in our dreams and in our nightmares. So if you rehearse this and put all the emotion into it while you rehearse it, this is eventually going to be reflected in the nightmare itself. It's what we call dream incubation. You incubate a dream. Dream about what you want to dream about or change some negative dream. Since dreaming serves such adaptive functions as fear, memory extinction, and affect regulation, these revised dreams desensitize the disturbing experience through repeated exposure in a less frightening context. Controlled and uncontrolled case studies found promising results for the efficacy of IRT for chronic nightmares in people both exposed to trauma as well as those not exposed to trauma. And then there is an offshoot, exposure relaxation and rescripting therapy. Patients attempt to engage in pleasant imagery before sleep had little effect on their nightmares. Using techniques derived from IRT, Davis targeted three systems in which anxiety was manifested. Physiological, increased arousal at bedtime. Behavioral, using legal and illegal substances to fall asleep, in other words, poor sleep hygiene. <coughs> Cognitive, the belief that sleep is inevitably accompanied by nightmares. And you will notice that this is her version of my three Bs, brain, behavior, and beliefs. Okay? Here are the treatment components. Educational, providing accurate information about PTSD nightmares. Exposure, directly engaging the fear network using both written and oral exposure to nightmare content. Rescripting, altering the nightmare's emotional components such as shifting from insecurity to security. Relaxation, progressive muscle relaxation or diaphragmatic breathing used whenever the client notices a buildup of tension or anxiety. Here's your homework assignment, folks. This is what people do during the day to alter or change the nightmares. Here is the research results, a randomized control involving 49 participants, most of whom were female, of whom 84% reported positive end state functioning and absence of nightmares in the week before the final report. This is astonishing, 84%, very successful. This was even higher than the 79% reported positive end state functioning for PTSD functions as a whole. Now, if IRT is combined with lucid dreaming, we introduce another dimension. Lucid dreaming is awareness of dreaming while one is dreaming but without waking up. As nightmares may trigger lucid dreams, lucidity can be used as the next step of the IRT approach. Case studies have illustrated the effectiveness of lucid dreaming interventions for nightmare reductions. So again, all of this nightmare reduction technology I'm talking to you about is pretty well evidence-based at this point. After a successful pilot study, researchers conducted a randomized control trial comparing IRT in a self-help format versus IRT combined with sleep hygiene, IRT combined with a lucid dreaming component, and a weight list control. Now, Again, the wonderful thing about a lot of this sleep hygiene and IRT work for nightmares, it can be done in a self-help format. You don't have to have constant contact with the therapist. And it helps definitely to have a group of uh, friends or fellow survivors do this together. Symptoms such as nightmare frequency, nightmare distress, and sleep quality were measured at 4, 16, and 42 weeks. Participants were solicited in the Netherlands through the internet. This is more and more common. You get your subject uh, population through the internet. IRT and LD participants were requested to reflect upon the origin of the nightmare, change the ending of the nightmare, imagine the changed dream including becoming lucid, saying this is not real, it's only a dream. The sleep hygiene emphasized finding a comfortable bed, using it for sleep and sex only, maintaining a regular sleeping and waking schedule. When I talk about PTSD as a whole, I often make the complaint that too many therapists who work with PTSD survivors ignore the survivor's sex life. Can you believe it? They ignore it. They don't uh, ask the veteran or the 
uh, rape victim or the accident victim, how's your sex life? Sex is bound to be affected by PTSD and you have to introduce sex therapy along with everything else if you're going to do a whole person approach, but that's another workshop, another lecture. <laughs> IRT without the sleep hygiene or the lucid dreaming component was the only condition that significantly reduced both nightmare frequently and distress better than the control group. The sleep hygiene and lucid dreaming <coughs> treatments showed a positive but not statistically significant effect upon nightmare reduction. The weakness, the study was not limited to people with PTSD, only with those with recurring nightmares, and the attrition rate reduced the total number of participants by over one half. Future studies should analyze the effects of LD on PTSD specifically without the IRT component, then we'd know a little more. But the important thing about this is that people were not hurt. Everybody was helped, at least to some extent. So this leads us to changing personal myths, and this is in my book, which is one of the ones I didn't have enough copies to bring tonight, but you can look at some of the other books that I did bring. Uh, the personal myth is a belief system that people have. And here are some examples of how a negative personal myth can be changed to a positive personal myth. And this is where I'm going to have Debbie Ellis give a little uh, cameo as we go through. A personal myth that comes up during a nightmare, I am responsible for the death of innocent civilians. Change that personal myth to terrible things happen in combat. Warfare itself is responsible. A part of me died as well. Okay? I feel guilty because I survived the automobile accident and my friends did not. You change that to, I am grateful that I survived and I will honor my dead friends by the way I live my life. Another negative belief. I can never forget the horrors of the time I was raped. Change it to, I might not be able to forget those horrors but I will not allow them to stop me from getting on with my life. Now, of course, the three beliefs here are irrational, they're dysfunctional, but as you know, those of you who are therapists especially, these incompetent, dysfunctional, irrational belief systems can haunt a person for one's life. And this is where I'm going to ask Debbie to give you uh, her point of view from an REBT perspective, okay? Okay, thanks, Dad. Thank you. Um, so, would you like me to speak for five minutes? Yes. yes. Can somebody please tell me for five minutes? Because we only have 12 minutes left. Oh, my. Okay, would somebody just wait? I'll, 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 I'll shut up. Okay, go ahead. Well, well, thank you very much. So, for those of you, how many of you have heard of rational emotive behavior therapy? Have any of you wondered about that? Okay, so it seems most of you are familiar with it. Terrific. Just to remind you, it's the pioneering cognitive approach that heralded in the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy. And one of its core messages or reminders is that it's not an event, including the most traumatic events imaginable that creates our emotional experience, but our perception of the event that creates the emotion. REBT reminds us that when we think in rational ways, we create healthy, non-debilitating emotions. They may not be pleasant, but they're appropriate. They're part of the tapestry of life, and they can be motivating. When we think in irrational ways, then we can create the unhealthy, debilitating emotions which include anxiety, panic, depression, rage, guilt and shame, um, a number of, perhaps in some people, all of, perhaps in some people, a few or one of those are frequently present in people who are experiencing symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So REBT elegantly and beautifully informs us what the components of irrational beliefs are, and I'll tell you very quickly, they are demands instead of healthy preferences. Demands meaning musts and shoulds and oughts. My husband had a quaint sense of humour and way of uh, expressing things, and he came up with the um, word, it has a U in it, so it's not my accent. 
he would stay and say, stop your must bathing. <laughs> and he'd say, stop shooting on yourself. Um, catastrophizing, awfulizing, damning oneself and others and life itself. Having an absence, in other words, of unconditional self-acceptance, unconditional life acceptance and unconditional other acceptance. So in many of the people who suffer post-traumatic stress symptoms, there's a lot of shooting going on. A lot of demands going on. Uh, Stan already touched on a few. Some of the irrational beliefs creating the debilitating emotions in survivors of great trauma include it shouldn't have happened. Those bastards shouldn't have done what they did, whether it's kill, whether it's bomb towers, whatever it is. I was um, here, not here, New York during um, when the, the, the towers fell, September 11, 2001, and I worked with recovery workers. Al and I both actually did volunteer work. I, I went near the site, um, Al stayed in, in the institute and he would come to him. Um, so there's the demands of what happened, shouldn't have happened. Well, it's not a helpful demand because it happened. And where does it get one to demand? It shouldn't. Rage, depression, hopelessness, powerlessness. There's uh, demands that life should be fair. And as, as Stan mentioned, I shouldn't have survived when others I loved didn't. And so what REDT invites us to do with vigor and precision is to dispute each and every one of those irrational beliefs that can be identified. Now, Stan rightly indicated that some survivors of extreme traumatic events can be allergic to therapists. And by the way, I am one, and having been with a number, I don't blame them. And so in my experience, and what I recommend for we therapists who do work with survivors of great trauma, a good first step, much if not most of the time, is to listen and empathise and normalise. And one of the things that normalising can do is to help the person experience greater unconditional life acceptance. When a person thinks this shouldn't have happened, then in all likelihood they will suffer for the rest of their lives until they change that idea and recognise, I've only got a few more, I'll take the liberty, one more minute, um, and recognise as the Buddhists say, as otherwise philosophies and approaches say, that life does contain loss and suffering. And when we rail against it, it doesn't change the event, it doesn't reduce suffering, it exacerbates and prolongs the suffering. So REBT urges us, both in our work roles in the therapy field and as human beings, to not only give helpful therapy, whether it be REBT or forms that Stan recommended, but to do the best we can to be healthy models. In all likelihood, we've suffered some form of loss or trauma. And so by practicing what we preach, we can be more authentic purveyors of true encouragement, reminding the person that for all of us, you know, life will have an end. And so in the time we have left, let us yet not deny what happened happened, but more than that, remind ourselves that we survived, train ourselves to think in healthy ways that changes the brain, have compassion on ourselves, on others, and accept that with life comes suffering that has resilient humans since it didn't kill us, we can focus on what's good and therefore minimize the suffering. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hang on to it, Debbie. I'll have you come back during the question period. <laughs> Those of you who are coming to the workshop in a few days will see Debbie give an example of REBT in action, by the way.
Okay, here is the summary. Kierkegaard stated that life needs to be understand, understood in a constantly changing nonlinear fashion. Epictetus reminded us that life experiences are more important than life events. Albert Ellis said the same thing, as I mentioned. PTSD survivors can begin to recover from their hidden wounds when they are treated holistically and viewed as unique in their struggle to survive. I have a whole lecture I give on time-focused therapy developed by Philip Zimbardo and a student of mine, which has an incredible rate of success in their follow-up studies. They didn't have one single suicide, except that time-focused therapy is at odds with the VA hospital system, and so it's only practiced in Hawaii where they have uh, state permission to do it there. Uh, so there are a number of good therapies that have trouble surfacing because the, for one reason or another they don't have bureaucratic approval. But that, again, that's another lecture. Dream workers can play an important role in the rehabilitation of PTSD survivors if they are properly trained and are able to establish rapport with the survivors. An untrained dream worker can move too quickly, re-traumatizing the PTD, PTSD survivor. I've got to re-emphasize that. Timing is very important in treating PTSD. That's why I like the Zimbardo approach because it takes time into the picture. There is a time to introduce different elements of the therapy and if you violate that time, you might re-traumatize the client. Another way the time enters in brings in epigenetics, which is a whole other lecture. Epigenetics is gene expression. Trauma can be so severe that it can show up in the next generation. We know that from the studies of Holocaust survivors, that the children of Holocaust survivors show PTSD symptoms, even though they didn't spend any time with the parents who were traumatized. And now they're showing up with the grandparents. So time at a number of different levels is a crucial element in treating PTSD. However, a trained and sympathetic dream worker can work with PTSD nightmares that may provide reduction of nightmares and other symptoms. Well-conducted therapy can evoke post-traumatic strengths that will benefit PTSD survivors, their families, their friends, and their communities. And don't take a look at this right now, but like I say, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, you are welcome to it. Here are a few of the many, many references that I've used to back up everything I say. I'm not a therapist, and so I've got to back up everything I say about therapy, and so there the references are, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your attention. Okay, talking about timing, I've ended exactly on time. <laughs> Debbie, why don't you grab a chair and you can help me uh, uh, field some questions. We don't guarantee answers, but at least we will be very, very happy to listen to questions. <coughs> and disagreements. This is a controversial field. Feel free to disagree. Yes. Thank you very much for talking. Uh, I, um, you mentioned um, using MDMA uh, yes. as a medication uh, to help uh, psychotherapy to treat uh, PTSD, yes. and you mentioned the concern of the side effect is patient. We don't want patient to get high, which right. I think is part of it. But uh, I, I believe a more maybe more uh, important well, concern. Too much feedback. I'm not understanding. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I think and I think what I would be more concerned about, you know, using MDMA. I'm a psychiatrist, so is that um, the uh, induction of um, uh, change of mental state and uh, maybe even dissociation or maybe even psychosis from MDMA. And uh, but I would say that uh, I, I was wondering uh, because you know we we probably using MDMA as a well, actually, it's just a res at a research state, but I assume uh, using MDMA may, may be in the inducing um, trends or change of state may be helpful uh, for psychotherapy. 
uh, during the process. So I was wondering with, uh, how, how, how is the psychotherapy done differently as opposed to sort of like the other uh, psychotherapy when a patient is, uh, has a, like a trance during the process and, and how do you take advantage of the trance uh, when you do psychotherapy for, for those PTSD patients? Yes, I think those are excellent questions and all I can say is just read the articles on MDA uh, psychotherapy. There's one by uh, Philip Boltz. You can get all of the copies by writing MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies in Santa Cruz, California. And to answer your question directly, sometimes dissociation is a positive thing. You dissociate from your current situation and then you can rebuild a new identity and new ideas when you come back to earth and get grounded again. Also, MDA is not given every day, every week, every month. The MDA is sometimes given once during psychotherapy, sometimes twice. It's not something that is recurring like medication is. So it's very, very sparingly given. And I think that, uh, again, this is a new therapy. Who knows what other problems, what other benefits will emerge? But at least your questions were sensible, and I think those are worth answering. Okay, did I answer, did I respond to everything? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next. I teach writing workshops with writing, um, writing with veterans, and um, I know from reading a lot of studies that it can be therapeutic. But when you were talking about the dream and rescripting the dream, it's very much like writing and revising mm -hmm. and taking those fragments and creating a story, a full narrative. And so I'm just curious what you know about studies about. The therapy that uses of writing. Yes. Uh, in some types of psychotherapy for, for PTSD, writing plays a very, very important part. I'm going to talk to this half of the room, which I've been neglecting, um, and tell you one of the controversies. The controversy in terms of creating a new nightmare is this. Should you change the belief system that's reflected in the nightmare. I mean, I talked with a veteran of the Iraq wars. She was in a tank and her friend had his head blown off. All she could see was purple haze coming out of his head. And that's something she has nightmares about constantly. Okay, now you cannot bring the buddy back, can you? So do you change the nightmare and have him come through safely? Or do you get new meaning out of it, having her do something in his memorial, taking care of his family, uh, helping out his kids, uh, and bringing that into the nightmare? So you can change the meaning of the experience, or you can change the experience itself, and there are arguments both ways. And the same thing would go to writing. There's no research indicating which is the better way to go. And it might vary from person to person. There has so, been so little emphasis on nightmare treatment that the only research that's been done is what I've shown you on the flip chart. We know that it works, but we don't know what aspect of it works. And so in writing, what do you do? You tell the story as it occurred, but with a different meaning in it, different existential emphasis in it, or do you make it a happier, more cheerful story that the person can eventually turn into the nightmare? Good question, and this is one of the puzzles that has yet to be solved. So I love your question. It gave me a chance to talk about one of the controversies in uh, nightmare treatment. Can I say something yes, about yes. that in REBT. So one of the things that REBT teaches therapists is the difference between elegant and inelegant solutions. Both can be beneficial. Inelegant usually has a shorter term effect. Elegant 
has a longer term event because you're looking for the root cause of the disturbed emotion. So what REBT might say about writing, and it would certainly encourage it, uh, REBT is very multimodal and whatever helps the, the client, the person. Um, but REBT would assert that that's an inelegant solution. It can bring some short-term relief or longer short-term relief. One doesn't feel a sense of shock and trauma once one has given something different meaning. But doing that hasn't rooted out and challenged ideas that contribute largely to the trauma and the panic, such as, this must not have happened. It's so awful that purple gut was gushing through my friend's head when they were, um, I can't stand it. And thereby neglects the possibility to encourage the person to remember how resilient that they are. That they can stand it, because if they couldn't stand it, they would have dropped dead too. That okay, it was a shocking image, but you know, and, and I won't go on and on if there's more questions, but REBT would respect timing and early on after a trauma, it's possibly better if you don't want the client to run away to use some of these so-called gentler, inelegant solutions. <coughs> but it would hope that a person in therapy would hang in there long enough and develop the willingness step by step with a therapist's help, or I agree group therapy in such a situation could be wonderful. You have a therapist, but other people who've gone through stuff who are also encouraging and affirming and normalizing in a sense to get to the root cause. So thank you for letting me add to that. And yes. Uh, another question of this then. You won't forget your question. You can be next. There's a question over there first. I'm wondering if you could say something more about the idea of soul retrieval. Um, or Didn't hear a word you said. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm wondering if you could say something more about soul retrieval. Oh, I'd love to. That's a whole other lecture. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, you have to. <laughs> Uh, there's a second piece to it. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm a student of clinical psychology, um, and I'm also a Buddhist in my you know, kind of outside. And so I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of other methods of healing that have been used in other cultures. And I also know that they might not quite apply or be well accepted, um, or even be able to, you might not even be able to do them really um, in the, our current situation. So the second piece of my question is, is there something that we can kind of bring from these indigenous practices that have occurred in other cultures that you know, might be relevant in our culture? Okay. Again, Debbie might like to say a few words after I do because she is currently writing a book about rational mode of behavior therapy in Buddhism because there's a lot of similarity, and her husband was aware of this, a lot of similarities between Buddhism and REBT. But let me respond to the soul loss question. Uh, soul loss is a term that I've run about in my contact with indigenous people, especially Native Americans. And they believe that in trauma, uh, one's soul is shattered because of what we would call maybe existential guilt uh, or other things that we would put in different terms. Sometimes the soul is jolted out of the body because of the trauma, and so the shaman has to go and retrieve the soul and bring it back. So in terms of what Western therapists do, it's a matter of paying attention to the, shall we say, the spiritual world view of the client and the purpose in life of the client and the way that, whether the client is religious or not, the way that the trauma is affecting that particular client's uh, uh, purpose in life. And that's the essence of retrieving the soul. Now, 
there is a Native American program that is done in different parts of the program country, and they don't often restrict this to Native Americans, where they do a great deal of work with cleansing, sweat lodge, uh, herbal teas, uh, going out in nature and commiserating with nature, not again to escape, but to reflect. And all of this is felt to nourish the soul. The herbal teas nourish the soul. Nature and the natural animals renew the soul. The community support, very important in terms of renurturing the soul. The shaman going into the other world and bringing the soul back and reattaching it to the body. Yeah, so they have a whole panoply of techniques for retrieving the soul and getting a lost soul back to the owner. Yeah, absolutely, and I've seen, I've seen some of this in action. Right. Yep, there you have some. Sure thing. Well, um, there are similarities and differences between REBT and, and Buddhism, and um, very, very briefly, some of the similarities are, um, uh, well, using the mind in a healthy way, um, compassion, loving kindness. Some of the differences are include. In some schools of, of Buddhist thinking and philosophy, absolutistic language. The seeker should seek the perfection of nirvana. Statements like that. And REBT is skeptical that most humans can for at least any length of time maintain a state of perfection, whatever that is. Actually, REBT doesn't really consider perfection possible, the romantic ideal. Um, REB, as some Buddhist schools will say life is suffering. REBT says that's overgeneralizing, but certainly agrees that life contains suffering. So there are similarities and differences. Um, in various schools of Buddhism, including Zen Buddhism, there are often parables and stories to make a point, and that's used in REBT as well. And if for any strange reason um, there's time and, and we run out of questions, I actually have a few brief uh, stories from Zen Buddhism that very much make REBT points. So main differences in, in some Buddhist writings and schools, overgeneralizing, black-white thinking, striving for perfectionism, nirvana, that, that REBT is skeptical about, and, and the quest to still the mind. REBT, rather than encouraging stilling, stopping the mind, being in a mind-free state, will encourage us to use the mind as our friend that it, it, we can make it a friend, not a, an audience monkey on the course. Okay, I just have a little asterisk to add. You know, Debbie and I will be here all week. Tag team. <laughs> so we're, doing a, we're doing a tag team kind of okay, thing. Okay, yes. Yes, if any of you teach classes and want Debbie to appear in your class, she's available. She'll be here all week with nothing to do until our workshop. Well, things to do. <laughs> Okay, the other response I want to make about soul loss is that uh, um, I have a friend who is in the Amazon Valley right now. He wants to be an ayahuasca therapist in Russia. And he has learned Spanish, he is working with shamans, and he is surprised to see a number of veterans, U.S. veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, come to the Amazon, they have PTSD, and the shaman is helping them retrieve their souls. And again, he has some incredible case studies that he's told me about. I'm telling him to write them down, which is difficult because Russian is his native language, Spanish is his adopted language, his English is fairly good spoken, but it's not so good writing. But this is very, very valuable material. What's happening in the rainforest of the Amazon with uh, American veterans who are taking ayahuasca and they are retrieving their soul and they are putting their lives back together again. And these are mainly people who have, 
who claim that the US medical system, the VA system, has failed them. They've gone to psychotherapy, they haven't gotten any better, so in desperation to save their life, they have gone to Brazil or Peru and are visiting the shamans. This is a whole untold story, which I hope will be told someday, and it's very relevant to soul loss. And talking about soul, we should add one other thing, <laughs> in all fairness, in the Amazon, some of the veterans are getting messages from their deceased buddies from the other side. And they are saying, come back and tell our parents that we're okay, we're on the other side, but we are happy, we will be seeing them after they pass. And so this is sort of a message of hope. And I've, I've written about survival after death in one of the books we have up here, but there are other people who've written on the topic much better than I have. And so this is something you don't get in mainstream US psychotherapy, but you do get it when you deal with indigenous people. And I keep saying that indigenous people have a lot to teach us about dealing with extreme problems like soul loss. And then one other thing, the very fact of PTSD, I think it's a normal reaction to a grossly abnormal situation. People are trying to survive. Evolution has taught us to survive. And the only way that they can survive a trauma is to engage in all of these bizarre symptoms and at least that keeps them going. It's better than, it's better than collapsing and going completely psychotic. And you go back to Darwin and you find out that he uses words like compassion and love frequently, frequently in his writings. He saw compassion as a basic adaptive mechanism. He never used survival of the fittest, by the way. That's not Darwin's term at all. Darwin wrote about compassion and love and bonds between people is essential to survival and those bonds are broken and PTSD is the result. So above and beyond everything else, PTSD reminds us of our humanness. It reminds us of our compassion. People who don't get PTSD are either very resilient or else they have antisocial personality. Let's hope the former. But uh, uh, again, PTSD can be a teacher to us all. Okay, last question. Why does the, the vet often crave to return to combat? Because the body still thinks it's in combat? Oh God, don't I wish I knew. Why the vets return to combat? Some of them go back three and four times. I would say, in my experience, and I can, I, I, I'm sure there are better answers than I can give because my experience is limited to a couple of dozen veterans who I've imited, I'm, that I've visited and have talked with. I'm not a therapist, as I told you. Although I have to tell you this, uh, all of my books are reviewed by the American Psychological Association Psych Critiques. The best review I ever got from Psych Critiques for a book was the book I co-authored with two clinicians called PTSD, Biography of Disease. I could not imagine the praise that I got from that book. Of course, I'm delighted it didn't sell several hundred copies, but at least it got a good review. And I just wrote about all the things I've been talking with you folks about tonight and more than that. Now, why do soldiers come back to combat? For one thing, there is a bond there, even a bond with people they haven't met. And that bond to them is more important than such saving the world from terrorism, saving the United States from its enemies. They know that that's fabrication of the military industrial complex. No, that's bond with their, with their comrades is one reason. Another reason is they've learned how to cope there. They've learned how to survive. They come back to the United States, it's like coming to a foreign country. People don't understand them. They can't get their own job back. They can't get their relationships back. They're happier in combat because they've learned how to cope in that situation. Sad commentary, but it comes up time and time again. I feel at home back in Afghanistan. In Iraq, I know what to do. Back here, I'm a stranger. I'm a stranger. I don't know how to cope back in the United States anymore. 
Excellent question. And it's possible that some of them might um, believe they have worth uh, because of what they've done and do. And when they act in heroic ways or put themselves in at, at risk, you know, for the country or whatever, they have the, the in our EBT's view, false belief that therefore I'm worthwhile. REBT and I think schools of Buddhism would remind us, we and other philosophies, that we have worth simply because we exist. And you know, I, I'm sure you know even more than I do of um, the returned veterans who are helped by having dogs. And it's the unconditional love um, they feel from the animal. And hopefully some, if only all, could learn, not instead of, but in addition to, make effort to having more unconditional acceptance of themselves. Uh, we haven't talked very much about non-combat PTSD and nightmares, but um, I can give you an anecdote. I always, I've got so many anecdotes and I rarely get a chance to talk about them, but this is very relevant to a uh, number of things that we've talked about. Um, I get invited to a number of indigenous ceremonies and last year I was invited to Canada, to north, to actually southwest Canada for a potlatch. How many of you know what a potlatch is? Okay, it's a good, good for you, it's a giveaway. A uh, famous chief had died and his tribe worked for three years to get enough material goods together so that they could have a farewell ceremony and give the goods away. And I was very honored to come up for the potlatch. The Canadian government has built a special building for ceremonies that Native American people use and it was three days of ceremonies. They had chiefs from a hundred different tribes in the front row. Each of them got a beautiful blanket as a gift. And I'll tell you about my gift later, that's part of the story. Well, the young man who was supervising the ceremonies had quite a story. What did they do on the stage? It was reenactments of the, of the uh, native myths and legends, mainly from the uh, Salish tribe, the Quakutl tribe, uh, some smaller tribes, and the costumes were beautiful, the masks were gorgeous, and so they asked me if I wanted to meet him, and I went to his home and I met him, and talk about PTSD, he told me his story. He was an orphan, his grandparents took him in, now this was several decades ago, and he had to go to school, but the only school was a parochial school, it was a Catholic parochial school. So his grandparents sent him off to school at the age of five or six or whatever, and he went off bright and shiny, but it was so far away he had to live in the school. So he went and lived in the school with, you know, other boys in the dormitory room, and he missed his grandparents so much he cried all night long. And so the next day the priest took him into the office, the principal of the school. I hear you cried all night long. Oh yes, I cry, I miss my grandparents. Well, we have to toughen you up. So when the boy came back to the classroom, his pants were dripping with blood. And the other boys in the classroom started to laugh and smile because they knew very well what had happened. The priest had raped them too. Everybody in the class had been raped by one priest or another. And then he couldn't wait till he got back. He told his grandparents, we don't want to hear such stories. A priest would never do such things. So there he was. He had a story to tell, nobody to hear him. He was having nightmares every night. The nightmares about being raped. He went through literal hell for eight years until he could get into the local high school. He got into the local high school no skills because he came from a fishing community. But the priests took him, and, and I should say the Protestant ministers weren't much better in the Protestant parochial schools, but that's another story. Uh, the priests put them to work 
on animal husbandry because they owned a lot of land. They owned a lot of land, and so this is what the boys learned. They learned how to take care of sheep and cows and goats, even though they were from fishing families. They were never taken out to sea. Horror story. So he got into high school. He broke loose. He became a drug dealer. He got into fights. He went to jail. He got out of jail, and by the time he got out of jail, one of his classmates had gone to law school. And he went to law school. As soon as he got his degree, he sued the priests and the nuns. The nuns didn't, uh, because of their anatomy, they didn't commit rape, but they invented scenarios and they had boys act out sexual scenarios with each other. Uh, anyway, they were all sued. Some of the priests went to jail and the Canadian government was so shocked they set up a $2 billion fund, not $2 million, $2 billion fund, and the native boys and girls who were molested could apply for money. There were 10 degrees of abuse, and counsel, the young man who I met, qualified for the 10th degree. He had been so severely abused and had so much PTSD. And what did he do with his mother? He bought a fishing boat. With his money, he bought a fishing boat. And now he's a very, very happy fisherman. And he says, I've had enough of Roman Catholic dogma. I'm going back to the old religion. And so he started to do these paintings. And then he started to do the masks that were worn in the potlatches. And that's how I met him. And he was working on a beautiful drum. And the drum showed the god of the sea and all of the creatures of the sea. And it was so beautiful, I looked at it, oh, what a beautiful drum. I should have known you don't compliment a work by a native person. Why not? The next day he gave me the drum. He'd stayed up all night finishing it, so he'd give it to me. One of the most beautiful gifts I've ever received in my life. It's in my office, and I've shown it to literally hundreds of people. And so that's how he recovered from PTSD. No, he doesn't have nightmares anymore. He recovered through art, through a love affair with the woman he's living with, social support, the law, the government that gave him a big chunk of money. And so, yes, there is hope. And he suffered uh, from repeated PTSD over and over again. And it's lucky he came out on the other side. So sometimes, sometimes there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Sometimes there's a ray of hope after years of abuse. And that's why we like to talk about post-traumatic strengths. And that's the hope I will leave you with. Thank you again. <laughs>